Scarlet fruits fall before the strong wind. Profuse blossoms wither in the white autumn. A narrow road caused my canopied chariot to overturn. The panicked team caused the double shafts to be smashed. With so few words, poet Liu Kuan sketched a sorrowful scene shortly before his death. As the five barbarians invaded and his countrymen fled southwards, he set his foot northwards in harm's way. In a mountainous enclave of the Jin Empire, he resisted the invaders for a decade. What happened to him? What kind of predicament ruined his efforts so much that he wrote down such desperate lines in the end? Liu Kun claimed to be a descendant of the Han Prince Liu Sheng, but unlike more famous claimants like Liu Bei, Liu Kun hailed from a family line of high officials. Together with his brother Liu Yu, Liu Kun had achieved celebrity status for his talented writing since his youth. The two brothers were part of an inner circle of celebrities called the 24 Friends. All of them were close to the imperial family. Liu also befriended the Zhu brothers, another family of high officials. He shared a passion for politics with his peer Zhu Ti, with whom he spent many nights talking about the ever-worsening situation in China. A Chinese proverb is accredited to their story. One night, while they were sleeping in the same bed, a rooster crowed, a bad omen in these times. Zhu Ti kicked Liu Kun awake, telling him it wasn't a foreboding sound, but a signal for them to begin their martial arts training. The two men rushed out of bed and performed a sword dance. When China sinks into chaos and heroes rise in arms, we should be avoiding each other on the central plain. It was the promise of the two men. Like other high officials and rulers, Liu Kun spent his early life on the fat of the land, corrupt, complacent, and conceited. That is, until the civil war broke out. Liu Kun saw something that changed the rest of his life. Barbarians in the hundreds of thousands form their ring of encirclement from the four mountains. I met plunderers once I moved my feet. I saw bandits once I opened my eyes. The people are scattered across the land. Barely two out of ten survive. Bare bones are lying on open fields. As an eyewitness of such misery, Liu Kuan accepted a new position, Inspector of Bing Province, to rule a mountainous enclave surrounded by enemies, and counter-marched to the north while the people were fleeing southwards. The Jin court only promised him a small amount of cloth and grains. He had to fortify and rule with only a few bare scraps and not much more. As he arrived to the Bing province via the Taihong Mountains, he, along with thousands of others in his posse, saw only misery that far exceeded his expectations. Offices and temples were burnt to the ground, where frozen corpses lie. Thorns have sprung up like a forest, and wolves abound on the roads. Worse yet, steppe raiders paid regular visits to this war-torn land, leaving just 20,000 households for the entire area. The former playboy Liu Kun, however, was not frightened. Surrounded in the city of Jingyang one night, he made such melodies with a step instrument that aroused the homesickness of the raiders, who could only retreat the next morning. Together with his people, he plowed lands with a shield on his back and slept with a quiver as a pillow. Thorns were cut off, corpses buried, offices, markets, and prisons were rebuilt. He persuaded thousands of barbarian households to submit to him. Thanks to his efforts, the long-vanished rooster crows were heard once more on the scorched earth of Jingyang. However, Liu Kun's crisis was yet to end. Despite his charisma, he was far from perfect in personnel matters. He favored an official named Xu Run for his musical talent, whose arrogance was despised by an otherwise straightforward general named Ling Hu Sheng. As the two quarreled, Liu Kun executed Sheng under the instigation of Xu Run. Shocked by the news, Sheng's son, Ling Hu Ni, defected to the Xiongnu. While Liu Kun left Jingyang for a battle, Ni took the city as a guide of the Xiongnu and killed Liu Kun's parents in revenge. Now let's take a look on Liu Kun's status quo. To the west and the south led the powerful Han state of Xiongnu. To the north, the Tuoba clan of Xiangbei, also known as Dai. And eastwards, Liu Kun made himself an enemy out of Wang Jun by raising laborers in his fief, who was backed by the Duan clan of Xiangbei. 
he was in desperate need of an ally for his survival, and he found it, the Tuoba chieftain Yi Lu. On the one hand, Yi Lu admired Liu Kun, but on the other, Xiang Nu's expansion had to be kept at bay out of his own interest. With his help, not only did Liu Kun retake the capital, he reconquered a large chunk of the Bing province, up until Yi Lu refused to march towards the Han capital at Pingyang. Liu Kun also made it to see the fall of Wang Jun. He received a letter from Shi Le, which said he was going to atone for his sins by eliminating a traitor, aka Wang Jun. In fact, it was merely a strategy of the cool and calculated Shi Le to reduce his threat from the west. With the death of Wang Jun, 10,000 of the brightest Jin troops were slaughtered. The authority of the empire in the north, both actual and nominal, crumbled in its last agony. Worse yet, Liu Kun lost his powerful ally not long after, as Yi Lu was killed by his own son in a coup. In comes opportunity. A Chinese general by the name of Ji Dan led 30,000 men to flee from the Xi'an Bay, then submitted to Liu Kun. With this newly obtained manpower, Liu Kun was deluded, thinking he could repel Shi Le, who was busy laying siege to a town in the east. Unfortunately, Liu Kun's army was routed while trying to lift the siege. He had to give up what he had built up for a decade and flee to the Duan clan of Xiang Bei. The chieftain's brother, Duan Pi Di, was also a great admirer of Liu Kun. They made an oath of blood and planned a counterattack on Shi Le. Unfortunately, with the death of the chieftain in 318, Liu Kun was involved in the succession war of the Duans. One of Liu Kun's sons chose to side with the usurper Mobo and sent a secret letter to his father demanding his defection. Although Liu Kun declined to comply and showed PD the letter, PD still found him suspicious and imprisoned him. At the time, a distant relative of the imperial family, Sima Rui, declared himself emperor at Jian Kang and formed the Eastern Jin court under the aegis of Wang clan of Longye. In their eyes, however, Liu Kun was challenging the legitimacy of the newly formed government. Therefore, the imperial court sent a letter to P.D., demanding the execution of Liu Kun. In P.D.'s prison, Liu Kun knew his days were numbered. In the poem at the beginning of the video, he lamented, Before my deeds have been accomplished, the evening sun suddenly shifts to the west. Time does not wait for me. It departs like the passing clouds. He said to his son, An imperial envoy came, and no one informed me what he said. It has to be in order to assassinate me. Everyone dies one day, but what I regret is that vengeance is yet to be served and grudges are yet to be wiped out. In the end, Liu Kun was strangled to death at the order of P.D. His whole life, all his resentment and regret were summed up in the final lines of his poem. How could I have thought that strong metal tampered a hundred times could become so soft it can be wound around a finger?